Preservation Act. Oh, sorry. I will call this meeting of the Community Preservation Act Committee to order at 6.01 p.m. on Thursday, November 4th, 2021. We are meeting remotely, I believe, through the end of the year. Um, before we go further, <clears throat> excuse me, can I have a volunteer to take minutes? Sam, thank you. I was going to volunteer. Sam beat me. Oh, uh, you're you're no, welcome to volume. if you wish, Anna. No, no, you could, Anna. Anna, if you're willing, if you can attend the next meeting and are willing to take them. I was going to say, actually, I will have to leave early because we have conservation commission. Oh dear. Okay. My, well, I, my I'm theory on volunteering early is like Andy's when you have a construction project, you go to the top of the house and get it over with. <laughs> In that case, would you like to switch for tonight? Maybe Anna could take minutes tonight. And oh, say if she wishes. Uh, I'm good either way. All right. Sam, yeah. I'll do it tonight if you want to do them next time. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. No so Anna will take the minutes. I appreciate it. Um, so let me make my announcements right now. I already told some folks that if this meeting runs long, I need to leave it 8.30, but then our vice chair will take over, but hopefully we won't go that, <clears throat> that long. So our, our next meeting is in six days, not seven, Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday because of Veterans Day. And at that meeting, we will hear the recreation proposals and then the following week, we'll meet again on Thursday on the 18th, and that will be the public hearing. And since we never know how many people may want to make a comment, everyone should be prepared to start discussing the proposals. We have, will have heard them all, and hopefully you will have done your evaluations and um, we will start discussing them. So I'll just say one more thing about the evaluations. I think everyone has chosen a, has a, some kind of <clears throat> method by which to assess them, take notes, et cetera. Remember that at the end of the process for each one, we'd like you to assign it a score between a one to five, where five is extremely enthusiastic. You, you really like that proposal, you wanna do it, one is, not interested, not important to you, whatever. And then we bring those scores to the discussion and it's not, it, it's not a simple vote. It's not like we add them up and then there we are. It will help us organize our discussions. We will talk about every single proposal. We'll have the opportunity to say what you like, don't like, why you scored it the way you did. Do we want to fund the whole thing, recommend a smaller amount, whatever. But, but the scores between one to five help, help us see areas of maybe more or less agreement and then areas of, of strong disagreement and, and where we need to focus our discussions. Okay? All right. So I see uh, Kathy Shane is also in attendance. Great. Tim. Sarah, I have, I have a question. Um, yes. No, last week, I said I was probably going to use the long spreadsheet, and I started to look at and do some of my own, and I am finding the shorter form, the one pager, more helpful for me. So for the record, I'm okay. going to be using the shorter form. And I did have a question on the one to five, uh, and is that per category or is it for all of them? So you don't have a five say for each of the categories or is it against? Is that, I guess no, that's no, it's each one in its own right. Okay. Whether you think it's a great proposal or not a great proposal. All right. You know, some years we might, it could be hard if we have a lot of very highly regarded proposals and then we have right. to wrestle with. Okay. How to, how to go from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So is, yes, we didn't lose anybody. I thought we, okay. Um, Sonia, is there anything new to know about the money situation? No updates. Okay. All right. Then I think we can launch right into the first presentation if uh, the presenters are in the waiting room. Should be hearing about the Conkey Stevens house. 
for. Sonia, do we know who that um, <laughs> is? We have um, uh, Gene, 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 Gene okay. Wilkins. All right, I'm going to make him uh, promote to panelist. I don't see them on my list. Oh, I'm not, I'll, I need to look in part attendees, got it. And the attendees raise their hands, like if there's somebody from, oh. So Jean, you can unmute and um, start <laughs> your presentation. Jean, can you um, hear us? There. There. Yeah, I, I, hang on, I've got it. <laughs> I, there. My computer is being funky since it, we uploaded Windows 7. So, um, the Conkey Stevens House is part of a mixed use condominium association. Um, most of the units uh, belong to people who live there. It's their primary residence. Um, some of the units are rentals. Um, there is an HOA fee, which is collected, which is enough to cover their, the expenses of the condominium complex. But obviously the expenses for the Conkey Stevens house, you know, far exceeds uh, what those, you know, 50 or so residents ought to be uh, shelling out because it has nothing to do with their own units. Um, it's a building that that um, ha, you know has significance for the town, but is not. It's uh, you know it needs more than what a, a mixed use condominium complex can supply. Uh, the people who built and owned that house were contemporaries of the Dickinsons. Um, and interacted with them in the town. And um, it is part of the East Amherst Historic District. It's a pretty prominent building. And um, it has fallen into disrepair. Um, the, the HOA has been taking care of it as things arise. But some of the projects that have to do with restoring it to its former um, grandeur um, is beyond the scope of the HOA. If, if you guys have questions, I would be more comfortable counter punching. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jean. Um, so committee members, and I realize I didn't take attendance. So I think officially I need to do that. So I'm sorry, Jean, just bear with me a moment. So Sam McLeod, here. Tim Neal. Here, present. Andy McDougall. Present. Dave Williams. Here. Eddie Startup. You need to unmute. Present. Thank you. Anna Devlin Goth here. Present. All right, that's all the, and I, Sarah Marshall, am here. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jane. All right, if you have questions, committee members, please raise your hand. Well, I have one and forgive me if, if this was addressed in the questions and answers. Um, how, many, how many condo units are in the house itself? Good question. Um, I can research that and get back to, it's about six or eight. Okay. Uh, I, somewhere I, in there. Yeah. I think what I most more want to know is, do they have a different assessment for the upkeep of that house compared to the, the folks in the units in the more modern construction? They have, generally speaking, much less square footage than the people in the residence, residences. Um, so the... Um, you know, if you own a, a, a unit with living room, kitchen, 
and a couple of bedrooms. That's obviously more than a one room office. So there's no differentiation between the kinds of buildings and the different kind of maintenance that's required. Yeah, oh, there's a big difference in the type of maintenance that is required. No, I mean in the fee. Um, it's not built into the fee. The people, the, the, the owners of the units in the historic house, do they pay a higher fee that goes to the capital, you know, capital improvements than? Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. So all unit owners um, contribute into one pot. As an example, there's one long building of a residential building and every unit owner in the, the Conkey Stevens house paid into, you know, their regular, uh, you know, uh, HOA fee plus the uh, special assessments and we put a $100,000 roof on that one building, then the other buildings also all needed new roofs and so, so um, the way it has been going is um, there, the condominium association was under some poor management. Uh, it was a long while ago now, um, slightly before I came on the board, but it was probably about from about 15 years ago till about 10 years ago. Um, there was money that was not, you know, the, the place was being neglected and the monies that were being collected, unfortunately, left town. So uh, the right. condo the association has been playing catch up with contractors. A lot of people were owed money. Um, there are a lot of repairs that had been left undone. So this condo association has been kind of paying, you know, paying out a lot of money and on the average has had a higher condo fee than comparable condominium complexes around town. But we are finally, finally caught up with um, you know, the priority has always been, of course, safety. So when someone steps out on their deck and falls through it, obviously the board has to decide to repair decks rather than the Conkey Stevens building, which has thankfully been so solid that it has stood for all these years of not getting the true attention it could have used. Mm -hmm. However, during all that time, we have always done the small repairs. You know, we've been replacing, uh, the slate shingles, for example, and you know, as leaks happen, we're we're up there repairing things. Uh, we had the wiring we done. We, you know, we've done. Uh, we rebuilt the porch, which was ready to uh, fall off the building, but we could only afford to do the base. We couldn't afford to continue all the way up. So, we have been sort of in emergency mode. And all the while trying to rebuild the capital reserve, which had been allowed to go down to nothing. So we are built, rebuilt the capital reserve. We're up at around hundred thousand dollars at this point. And um, you know, we we are we have a positive cash flow. Um, most of the emergency stuff has been dealt with. The biggest project facing the HOA is um, it's going to be extremely expensive to repave the entire parking. Um, all the tar needs to be retarred. So there are a couple big projects like that. Um, the biggest project, however, is the Conkey Stevens House, which those projects are so big that there's no way to do it halfway. You can't start the mason with staging when you're going to need to staging again to do the roof, for example, you know, so we turn to all of you. Thank you. Andrew? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so kind of jumping on one of your last points here, of, it, it's, it's a large ask. Um, of, of the money, if we were not able to, um, to, to provide money for the entire project, um, what, how much of the work would you say is critical? I know you, in your proposal, you carved out the fence, but um, you know, how much of this would you say is, is, is truly required um, for things like safety and so forth, um, and how much of it um, could be offset uh, or delayed a year or two if need be? Um. I, the thing that absolutely must be done is the roof. And in order to do the roof, 
the chimneys have to be repaired. So I lumped those two together. Um, they can't flash to a chimney that is going to, you know, which requires them to pull away the flashing to do the, the, the pointing and rebuilding. So, and they both need to do that work. The danger for the porch uh, isn't a danger. Um, I mean, the, the underneath structure is as solid as a rock. It, I went, was crawling under there myself. It's, it looks as good as the day they built, rebuilt it. Um, so the, the porch is not going to fall off the building. It's the fascia boards that are rotten and the, the um, you know, and we don't want that rot, the, the way the gutter is attached, you know, it, the, the, the poor gutter fitting on the rotten boards, it dumps the water against the building and it also dumps it ultimately where it is near a corner of the building, which I, you know, that's not a healthy thing for the building to have all that water getting dumped toward that corner of the sill. So um, if, if we had to break it up, I tried to do that in my prison. I hope that it was legible and understandable what I wrote, but the roof and masonry need to, need to happen. We need to secure the building. And then if the wood you know, once the water isn't continuously hitting on the wood, maybe even if it is rotten at the surface, maybe it will just dry out and stay that way for another year. Okay. It, so, you know, so perhaps I can, I can ask the condo association to rip off the fascia boards and just tack something fresh back up, up there. You know, uh, we can do a Band-Aid approach to the porch until we can get back to it. Got it. Okay, so, so just... So the essentially from your funding needed that option one is really the critical. That's the hundred twenty thousand that would address the yes. uh, the masonry and roofing. Okay, um, very good. Thanks. Okay, Tim. Uh, <clears throat> that was actually going to be my question <laughs> as well. But uh, while I I did think in terms of uh, the historic significance of the house. Uh, can you talk to, I understand it's in the Dickinson district, et cetera. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how many other Amherst residents uh, value or would be affected by the historic components of this project or this house? I don't know if I, I'm answering this question correctly. Uh, let's put it if the Dickinson house, for example, was uh, in need. Uh, to me, there that's many, many, many people come and visit and understand that and it's a huge community resource. Uh, this house, people drive by it and those might go in to see the folks in their offices. But other than that, what other historic, uh, I don't take this the wrong way, but what other historic value is there and compared to say some other historic structures in town? That's what I'm, that's the genesis of my question. Well, I, you know, I'm going to shoot from the hip here. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, when I was a little girl growing up, we used to call that the haunted house. <laughs> and I, I don't know how long you've all lived in Amherst, but that house had um, an elderly member of, of the uh, Stevens family living in there who uh, could, couldn't afford to keep it up. Um, it, it will continue to be, to, to, become more and more of an eyesore to the town. And I, I that, that alone, you know, we've got the, the um, as opposed to being a, a grand old structure that represents how the, you know, what the town looked like at the turn of the century or even before it's 181 years old, 200 years ago and have it be a, a good building, you know, um, you're right that there are offices in there. Uh, they get, uh, they have had until, you know, we've got COVID now and the building is being used less uh, during COVID, but it, it serves a lot of people in town. A lot of people utilize that building uh, in terms of going in and having their appointments. And it's especially well located for, uh, you know, students because there's a bus stop near there and also because it's close enough to the middle school and the high school uh, where kids can come and have their 
doctor appointments and the parents can still be at work. And that's been proven, you know, really valuable to a lot of a number of families in town. Thank you. I can't, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I said, okay, Tim, please put your hand down, <laughs> the yellow hand down, right? <laughs> we all need to remember to do that. So now Sam and then Hetty. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean, for your presentation. Tim, you're really quiet. I can't hear you. I think your microphone, your thank microphone you. yeah. Uh, thank oh, you, Sarah. You. And thank you, Jean, for the presentation. Uh, I had a follow-up question, uh, slightly different way of phrasing uh, Tim's question, which is, given that the house uh, is comprised of private condominium offices, uh, what access would you envision the public having to the building? Uh, that's my first question. I, well, um... I don't know whether to say this out loud or not, the building is always unlocked. Um, you know, it's it's a public resource. I, I don't know what how to answer that beyond saying that. I, I was thinking in terms of usage, there are some buildings that have uh, facilities that are regularly available to the public or rented for use and things along those lines. That's, uh, I'm not familiar with the occupants and the owners of the uh, units, which is why I was asking uh, just the general. I see. Um, aside from the external appreciation of it, I was trying to get an understanding uh, if there's, you know, tactile coming in tours, things like that. There are no tours of the building at this point. Um, you know, the reality is that those of us who have offices there are all very gray haired and white haired and nearing retirement. And if I, I was kind of making a joke at the Amherst Historical Commission meeting that if the town was interested in that, you know, to hold a museum or something, um, you know, the, the future use of that building is something that can be quite open to discussion. Um, if the town wanted the building even for uh, to, to be a museum or a boys and girls club or, you know, you know, utilize it in some way, I imagine that a lot of those units will be turning over and in the not distant future because we're all nearing the end of our careers and Okay, uh, I had a second question. I I walked around all the, the buildings this week and uh, I counted on that building 48 shutters, 32 of which are on the front brick area. Um, is the estimate including uh, work to the back uh, non brick, non primary original house? There are some shutters on that there, section. Yes, the, the work. Um, I agree with you and it needs to be further investigated about the shutters being specifically named and that's a concern I share with you. But there, there is also, if you look at the um, estimates I gave you, um, the, there is a painter who is making estimates on uh, repairing and painting the wooden portions of the building. The, fr the oldest portion of the building is the brick portion and the old, only wooden parts are the parts that would be coming under the work of uh, Le Liberté uh, estimate, where he's talking about replacing the wood and, and painting. But it's funny, it, you picked up on a very good point, which is none of them specifically says, the, writes down the word shutters. And between now and, and you know, actually signing a contract with them, that needs to be delineated. Yeah, I did see the $20,000 expense allocated to acquisition of shutters, which if it were the 32, it'd be about $600 a shutter. If it were the 48, it would be different. 
Uh, but I was asking primarily to distinguish between the original historic portion of the building and the extended uh, section in the back. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you uh, for uh, sharing your understanding of that. And um, I guess that's those are my questions for now. Thank you, Eddie. Um, hi, and thank you, Jean, for your presentation, and hello, everybody. Um, when we discussed this at the Historical Commission, um, I think it was um, pretty interesting to sort of see how one piece of this ask is related to an another piece, um, and it does look like a big bottom line um, dollar amount. And we had um, a suggestion about the budget um, in terms of maybe the HOA picking up um, the payment of the furnace replacement, which you'll see in the in the budget description numbers. Um, so that might um, contribute to a little bit of a different uh, bottom line. And and also we we talked. Um, with everybody about sort of phasing the project so that we would take care of, you know, the roof and the flashing and chimneys as part one, and then we would go to the next things. I mean, th this is complicated work and, and the scaffolding alone is a big expense. And once you've got it up, you know, you need to be efficient in the way you think about that in terms of the town's money. Um, so, so I think that that most of our concerns were related to timing um, and when bits of the work could be done. Um, that was that was in our discussion. Um, but you know, historic houses aren't, you know, they can't wait in the way that perhaps more, you know, younger resources can. I have a couple of quick points of clarification. One is that the house is not part of the Emily Dickinson Historic District, which Emily Dickinson House is actually its own historic district, I think. And um, the Conkley Stevens House is actually part of East Amherst Historical District, which is really cool. And it's very much a house that we see if we're coming into town from the east um, part of the, the, the area. So it's it's an important distinguishing building, you know, from the outside for the public, you know, even if access to the inside is at the moment limited by virtue of what its use is. Um, and I think there are lots of ways we could make this house, you know, sing to a wider range of people without, um, you know, interrupting the, the work of, of the people in the offices. It could, we could do a virtual tour, you know, and in that way, make it available to people. There are, because of COVID, we've got all these, different ways of reaching people. And, and so that's, I think, not a way to, to think about, you know, not funding it because it's not somehow accessible. It definitely is. Thank you, Hetty. Um, I, I will just say that we're a little pressed for time. So so do, so this purpose of this meeting is to get answer, you know, ask our questions of the applicant and we will we will be hearing all the pros and cons within the committee about each project. Um, um, yeah, and I'll, it, we'll want to talk about everything you just mentioned, but I think we need to check if there are no more questions for Jean from members that, Tim has one more, okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, I just want clarification. I too uh, did site visits on all these projects. And I was unclear, is this project for only the big front part of the, the house, the house you see from the street, there's a, there's a back addition that goes out I might have, on a lower level that it attaches to the big house. Is this only for the front part of the house or does it include the back? Well, the back is actually part of the historic, the back, um, let me look at my dates. The back is actually part of the Conkey Stevens house. Um, oh, it was built in two phases, but the renovation was done, I believe, uh, 1860, wait a minute. Anyways, you know, that that is not, not part of the building. Let me just- oh, um, okay. Sorry, thank you. I was not yeah, clear about that's that. That's important to know. 
Can, can you say 1868, that again? 1868. The entire For structure the is an historic property. Thank the, you, Sarah. Yes, oh. yes, okay. okay, all right. Thank you. So I think we need to move on. Thank you, Jean, very much for coming tonight to okay, answer a question. You. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So now we are looking for someone from maybe George Naughton from the Simeon Stronghouse. Yeah, I'll, yep. I'll promote him to a panelist. Okay. I think I just did, Sean. I'm not sure. Got it. Yeah. I still see Jean in the participants. There's George. Welcome, Hello, George. Everybody. I want to, yeah, I want to make sure we're, um, we're removing, <laughs> removing people when they're- you want, you want me to- Well, I don't know. Can Jean do it herself or does Sean need to move her out? I, I put her back to an attendee. That's fine. Okay. All right, then we will welcome George Naughton from the Simeon Stronghouse. Thank you for coming tonight. And uh, please tell us about your proposal. So the Simeon Stronghouse is over 250 years old. It's the third oldest house in Amherst and is itself one of the prize pieces in the collection of the Amherst History Museum's artifacts but we've never conducted an actual structural engineering exam of the house to determine its physical condition and what preservation and care it might need. Uh, during the 1990 Jones Library construction, our building suffered damage to its foundation, which then needed concrete and steel reinforcement. Last spring, one of our window frames suffered wind damage. And then in the summer, we had pieces of plaster fall out of the second floor ceiling. Uh, locally, global warming means that we may expect more warm, wet, humid weather, which would have predictable effects on the old plaster and old dry wood. Uh, we can expect more powerful wind storms. And the projected Jones Library renovations may involve demolition of some of the existing foundations, which could have more impacts on the Stronghouse foundations. Uh, society itself, Amherst History Society, is interested in making some changes to the buildings. We'd like to install an HVAC system. We would like to make it more handicap accessible. Um, we might even want and be able to build an addition for more gallery programming. And all these events are happening as we have no definite idea of where we stand with the building and its structural strength itself. So our proposal is simply that we find out. Thank you. Are there I think one obvious question, maybe I'll just kick it off, is <laughs> when do you expect to have have an estimate? Because we will start, um, you know, deliberating in, in, in as soon as two weeks. That's not the deadline, but it'll be we're, we're moving quickly. So, um, I had some people. I had uh, Jake Smith of Thayer Associates and Jim Colaney, who's one of his associates. Uh, they were looking at the building, we did a full three-story plus the attic and basement walkthrough yesterday. Um, I can bug them about getting an estimate. I understand that you're not going to allocate funds until you have an estimate. Um, so I should have numbers from them. I've had trouble finding other structural engineers or architects who are willing to examine the building. Um, I, I asked one firm and they said, we don't do that. And I asked another and they recommended Jake Smith of Fair Associates. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm still working on getting more than one estimate, but at least we're going to have one set of numbers in hand. Thank you. Andrew. 
Well, you sort of stole my question, probably many other people's questions. I will ask this though. Uh, first, thanks for the presentation. Um, and then just to be clear, this is purely for the survey. So this would not be any remediation. Uh, you wouldn't expect to use any of this money for remediating anything that, that might be identified through the survey? That is correct. It's just to get the, the survey. Okay, thank you. Tim? Uh, <clears throat> First, uh, in uh, public disclosure, I was a, or I am a former trustee of the uh, Historical, Members Historic S Association and the Strong House. A uh, number of years ago, I was on the board of trustees. My question is, have you talked to UMass and might this be a graduate student project uh, or does it take much more professional uh, study than that kind of an approach? Um, excuse me. No, we have not talked to UMass. And that sounds like a good line of inquiry. Um, I'm not sure how far I would trust a graduate student um, to do an accurate job on this. I mean, what can I say? A graduate student is not a professional and has not had the years of experience. Any other hands? I, Katie. Well, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. I um, thank you, Sarah, and thank you, George, for your application, your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I I'm not um, familiar with. Um, the association in terms of its um, financial um, position. So I just wonder about once you have this analysis, are there funds to um, take action? Um, I think I can honestly say no. <laughs> um, we're a small, poor local history museum. We're not the Dickinson Museum. Um, and once we find out what's going on with the house, then we would have to prioritize what should be done next. So in terms of fundraising or grant, other grants that you would need? Fundraising to or, or grants or okay. something like that. Uh, finding wealthy benefactors. Got it, thank you. I wonder if, if George or maybe at some others in the group can tell me what is in what is involved in the engineering survey. Are they using instrumentation to <laughs> measure see if beams are deflecting, or is it just casting a very expert eye over every little piece of the building that can be accessed? When I walked through them, yes, walked through with them yesterday, uh, there was not a lot of measurement. Um, there is no drilling into walls to take core samples. Um, they didn't do anything with tape measures. As you say, it was the um, casting the experienced eye over what, what is presented and some discussion about what's underneath some of the, what's presented. Um, one example was uh, in an upstairs room, there were uh, corner columns that are wider at the top than at the bottom. And uh, Jake Smith remarked on that and Jim Colaney said, oh yes, that's just sort of the facing and that's not actually the beam. Um, gunstock beams is what they call, he said. Um, so it was, they were having a conversation um, and the places where the plaster fell down, they could see what was underneath it. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks for the quick follow up here. It's more of a like amusing here, I guess. Um, if um, so, Sarah, if uh, if George is not able to uh, to get a, a reliable quote um, within the next couple of weeks, should we should we ask for like a placeholder figure just so we can evaluate this? Um, I think I would seek some guidance from Sonia at that point. I mean, we know, we know we are required to either award or reserve 
10% of new revenues for historic preservation. So, yeah. But um, on the other hand, we have lots of requests for historic preservation funds. So, right. I mean, yeah. the 10% the ten percent, the 10% requirement is of new revenue right. that you either appropriate to programs, or if you don't have any programs, then you would put it in a reserve. So um, that's the only avenue to this is if you wanted to move forward with this project and you wanted to reserve some funds um, when it came back, that would be the only avenue. But then it's also knowing how much funds you want to reserve for this as well. I can certainly get in touch with uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Kalani and at least try to get, I mean, a rough estimate, give me a ballpark that they could then refine. Right, like is this $30,000 or $100,000? Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. that would that would be helpful. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, they're professionals, they're employed, they have jobs to do, but I think I can at least get that from them, that get some kind of range. All right, any other questions from the committee? Sam? It's not a question, I just uh, had a comment and thank you, George, for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to commend the approach of uh, gathering information, of attempting to gather information and uh, getting an accurate analysis and studying uh, before you embark on a plan. I, it's certainly a historical house for uh, Amherst. Uh, I know it well, and uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. All right, I don't see any other hands up, so. George, I thank you for your time. And just shoot, if you get if you get any more information, just send it to Sonia and she will distribute it to the committee. Well, thank you for your time. Okay, pleasure, thanks, good night. Good night. I think Sean will move you out of this meeting somehow. <laughs> no, I'm supposed to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hang on a second. He brings them in and you, no, I'm practicing. Oh. I think he left, or in, if you didn't remove him, so I, think I just did. So okay. <laughs> okay. So now we are looking, perhaps, for Dorothy McCaffrey. Yeah. Or some right. other you know, to speak to the Alice Maud Hills House application. <clears throat> I promoted her. I didn't see her coming up though. Oh, there she is. And also coming up. Coming up. Okay, we can hear you now. We don't yet see you, Scotty. Yes. Yeah, ah, here we are. <laughs> oh, you're you're in the house. <laughs> Yes, we thought that was a good way, good way to uh, make our presentation. Um, Please proceed. Okay, um, the, uh, this is a, a grant that we're looking for is to paint and repair the outside of the, the Alice Maud Hills House or the Hills Memorial Clubhouse, which is its actual legal name, I think. The house was built in 1864. Um, the Women's Club as an entity was created in the 1890s, and the house was left to the Women's Club by Alice Maud Hills in 1921. So we have uh, maintained the house all that time and had our meetings here and people uh, rented for small weddings and things like that. Um, we feel that we're an important part of although we're not connected to the Dickinson house we are part of the Dickinson Historical District. So we're right next door to those buildings. And um, we, we feel as if coming into the town, when you get almost into the center of town, if you're coming down Main Street, you see our house, the Dickinson house, and the other Dickinson house as you come down the street. And I think it's a nice introduction into the town. Um, we have, we were asked the question, um, 
about maintaining the house. We have maintained the house for the last 100 years. And in the last 20 years, we have completely revamped the HVAC system in here. We've added uh, air conditioning to the public rooms. Uh, we have uh, redecorated it um, with wallpaper, paint, and lighting that's appropriate to the Victorian period. Um, curtains, shades, all the inside of the house. We certainly have spent a lot of time and energy bringing this house. We think it's it, the pinnacle of, of its decoration, but the, what needs to be done on the outside is far more than we can afford at this time. And we feel as though, um, you know, when it was presented to us that we could, we could apply for this grant, we felt that this was something that we could and should do. Um, we have also uh, repaired three of the four roofs on the main house. Although if you look at the, um, I'm sure you have, the, you have the bid, some of the smaller roofs need to be fixed. Um, and of course the club's work involves giving scholarships to the high school every year and also giving money to the um, community service organizations that apply to us. We have kind of a grant system and they can apply. Now last year, because of COVID, we couldn't raise any money. So we didn't give any of those grants, but we will be doing so again this year. Um, I think too that the house, the club, and I think, I think of the house as representing the club. And I think the club has been notable in the history of Amherst and in a couple of interesting ways in women's history. And also in the fact that there have been a couple of Famous members, Helen Hunt Jackson was an, um, a member and she was someone who worked very hard for um, the rights of Native, Amer Native Americans. Um, and she wrote a, a book named Ramona, maybe none of you are familiar with it, but it was a book about Native Americans. And um, I'm old enough that it was something that people read when I was a kid. Um, we have also, uh, we have on the second floor, there are three small apartments. We've also brought those all up to code and fixed their um, electrical system so that um, they are more, uh, what's the word I want, economical. Um, let's see. I, um, I just think it's important that we are able to maintain the outside of the house. Uh, And I would like to be open to any questions. You have any questions to question us further besides the information you probably already have. Sure, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's time for questions from the committee. I just see one hand so far, Andrew. I'm happy to go second or third. I feel like I've been the first uh, one all the time. Well, all right, um, then Tim can go first. And then all right. <laughs> you're okay. muted, yeah. No. Oh. Sorry, I, I kind of feel the same way, so I don't particularly. Go ahead. <laughs> Just someone has to start. So, all right. Well, I'll start. All right. How many members of the uh, Amherst Women's Club? Ninety. Ninety, and are they all women? Oh yes. Yeah. Well, it is a women's club. Yes. Well, um, in today's society, frankly, I didn't know the answer to that. <laughs> well, it is. Um, okay. Yes. Pardon me. At 90, okay. And had you, uh, if, as you know, we're tight for funds. Uh, if this committee approves some of the funds, is it at all possible to ask the members to chip in another piece? Or is that really something that just doesn't seem to fit in the equation? We are all the time doing that. Our membership is constantly, our membership is constantly funding this club by donations and also okay. from our uh, membership uh, dues. Okay. And presently we're repairing part of the portico and that's being paid for by the members. Okay. Yeah. Those are, and I guess the last question is, other than the club and the 90 members, what other public use and access is there of that facility? You mean who uses it besides us? Yes, well, the, other, I, the, the, the town of Amherst, uh, is it well, the, the other citizens in the town, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we often have concerts and things like that that people come to. 
the public is welcome anytime. I mean, our meetings are always open. And I think since we've been doing some of them this year, we've been doing them in person and on Zoom. And I think more people are connecting to it. People rent it, but I don't think that's what you mean, do you? Um, I do actually mean you get that. The small I mean, showers. My, my, yeah, my wife sang in a group called Wings, and I know there were several practices they used, yes. but I didn't know how many other organizations. What I'm looking for is, other than the members, what uh, universe of uh, Amherst citizens actually benefit from the house other than just seeing it when they drive by. Well, the league, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have all that information, but I'm hearing from the audience here that the League of Women Voters uses it, which I didn't realize. Um, LIR. All around the world, women, I don't, that's a local group. Mm -hmm. The Travelers Group, that's another group. The Women's Club. Yeah. Um, and also we have uh, uh, people coming here to have their meetings. That is part of our uh, uh, renting of the house as a venue for uh, um, small uh, family uh, gatherings or maybe meetings of some uh, uh, institutions. I didn't realize, excuse me, I didn't realize the thing that people give on music lessons here. So. We have a lovely grand piano. I know, I'm familiar with that. Okay, thank you. All right, now, Andrew. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, thanks for the presentation to, to the whole team over there. Um, my question's somewhat similar to what Tim had asked originally, of just the the ask, the 166,000. Um, I, I just done a quick, I, like summed up the, the numbers that you had and it didn't quite get to 166,000. And then you had also mentioned that the committee there that the the women's club is committed to spending thirty thousand towards the project. So I'm, I'd love to just sort of understand better what the actual ask would be, because um, again, just you know, the math is wrong. The, it didn't add up to one hundred sixty six. You know something? I am embarrassed to tell you that I just took this bid, and I did not re add the numbers up myself. And I okay, good. That that is good to know. So, so then I, I guess another, an add-on question to that, when I first saw the headline of this, um, which was uh, exterior painting and repair, you know, the, the 166 seemed like a, a large number. I'm wondering, how, do you have uh, more than one quote um, that help, would help us understand sort of- yeah. uh, Well, that was a know, question- How competitive that is, and, I'm sorry, just how competitive that is, and then also like better understand the, the scope of the work. Um. I had that question early on in this process when I first got the application and started filling it out. And so I wrote to the person who was given to me by Mr. Blockman as the contact person, and Mr. Delaney, who I understand doesn't work there anymore. So I asked him, do we, um, how, and basically how many uh, quotes do we need? And he said, if you believe it's a good estimate, one will be fine. And the reason that we use the estimate that we have is because Ronald Keith, who, who um, has helped us to maintain and restore and refurbish the house for 25 years, and he has experience with the historic uh, restitution, <laughs> restoration. <laughs> and it, I mean, he understands the building, its problems and its peculiarities. And we feel like he has the skill and knowledge, but since we were told we only needed one estimate, then we didn't go any farther. Well, actually we did. And uh, uh, we are expecting from a Valley Home Improvements uh, a potential uh, proposal for this uh, type of work. So we are expecting. We got promised that they will do the estimate. That's great. Okay. Sure. If you get revised a, a second bid or, or you check the numbers on your first bid and they didn't add it, just, just send in the new information to Sonny and that's that's fine, okay. but, but as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'd love to see that again. It's, I, I don't have experience doing this type of uh, restoration. So I, I, it would be very useful for me to understand, you know, whether this is market and again, better understand the scope of the work. Um, well, did, did you get the actual estimate from the contract or just the one that I put into the application? I am looking, so apologies if that was shared and I've not seen it. I'm looking just at your application. If it's part of the materials and that's on me, I've got to go back and check. Well, 
we were asked supplementary questions by Sonia. And when I answered that, I also emailed her the actual, well, this is my copy with a lot of writing on it, but um, it's three pages long and this is the contract estimate. I mean, I sent it. I didn't send it originally. I just asked, you know, I just put in. It should be in the packet for tonight. Excuse me. No, no, no. Please. It was added as addition with photographs and PDF yeah. file of the contractor's um, rotation. Yeah. Do so you it's have there? Do you there have you the photographs? No, it sounds like it's been. It sound like it's been sent, and I'm just a, a, a click behind. So if thank you for sent, doing that. Yeah. If you've sent it, then we'll get it, and we'll be sure to to review it. So well, the thing was that um, when I was submitting it, um, my computer couldn't. Um, handle all those pictures, so which I didn't realize. And when I called the town hall, I talked to Brianna, and she said, "Bring your computer up here." So she took care of it. <laughs> okay, she took the pictures from my computer and sent them wherever it was. She sent them. Okay, I right. as an addition or a appendix to the uh, proposal that was sent yeah. on the same day when the proposal was. It was the day it was due. Okay. Thank you. Know, also, PDF file of the quotation. Yeah. All right. Well, we will track that down if we don't all, okay. each of us have it right now. So, any more questions? Who? From the committee, Sam. Yes. Katie first. Oh, Katie, um, you were there first. That's okay. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Dottie and company. Really appreciate your application and your presentation. Um, it's so funny, um, Andy, I did, I added up the numbers and I thought they added up to more than 166,000. So I, had a, <laughs> I have a different problem. Um, but I had seen that um, in today's packet, but I, so my question was whether it's 166 or 169 or less, was the 30,000 to then be reduced from that, that you're, so that the ask is actually less than the 160, whatever? Sure. If we could contribute to it, and that's what she's asking. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. The answer to your question is yes. Great. So, so we, we can contribute. A, we can contribute thirty thousand dollars from our treasury. Great. Well, that's wonderful. And um, so it sounds like the ask would be whatever the total is, which we'll find out, and less 30,000. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the clarification. Yeah. And... All right. Sam, did you already ask your question? Is I it... did not. Okay, so Katie, if you can lower your hand, yellow hand, thanks. So uh, thank you, Dottie, and the rest of you at the club. Uh, in response to Andy's earlier or Tim's earlier question, both, I can attest to the usage of the uh, women's club in the community. My brother was married there. We had a, a 90th uh, celebration for my grandmother's in years past. A friend of mine's uh, had a memorial service there. It's widely utilized, uh, and it's a, a location that's available to uh, rent and for others who might be viewing it, it's a wonderful location. I mean, it really is, uh, uh, it has a certain ambiance to it. Uh, but my question for you in relation to the proposal is, I have a few. Uh, one is, when was the building last painted? Oh, well, Libby, when was it last painted? I think it was the 1970s, but I wasn't. No, no, no. Oh. 2004. 2004. Okay. 2004. Um, I have quite a lot of experience in the subject area. I was a uh, painting contractor for 10 years, having done all kinds of buildings and complexes in all facets. Uh, and I also was a uh, manager, market manager for Sherwin Williams for three years. So I'm very familiar um, with the scope and the nature of what's being done, not the reparate, not the repair work. Um, I do advocate just based on my own eyes multiple estimates uh, in, in all the years that granted I was doing the work back pre 2000, 
but it, it's a very large ask. And there are a lot of variables that come into play, but I can tell you from my own experience, uh, there's really a wide range in uh, pricing structures that might be received by an organization. And for any organization, you know, for me, if it, if it were my own personal house and I were considering a job of that scope, I would want to see a number of varieties. And so I highly uh, align, uh, I guess, with Andy's inquiry with the concept of, of multiple uh, estimates, because my belief is there'd be a significant range. Uh, you know, when, when we're talking $20,000 for the carriage house, uh, the, the number, you know, it's a large ask. Um, as a committee, one of the things that we have to consider one of the things that we have to consider is the concept of maintenance as it as it relates within the uh, Division of Labor Services. And I recommend, you know, the other committee members when we come to that point in time, our key aspect of our decision is to distinguish between uh, maintenance and or restoration, which is why one of the questions was as such. Uh, but, but that's really, uh, the essence of the questions. I'm assuming, and you could ask from whoever provides estimates, if they're incorporating prevailing wage rates into the estimates. Uh, I assume that to be the case, mandated and based on the amount. And, you know, it, it's not a small amount. It's like 60 some odd dollars or so, depending on the nature of the painting, but it's worth your, your asking for any quotes that you get. Um, and I, I also think it's in your interest to uh, identify the approximate materials components. Uh, I, rec I see which versions are using, using the Sherwin-Williams Everlast. I checked the other week and they, four times a year, the stores that sell this have a 30% off sale. And given that the cost per gallon of the upper $90, you're talking huge savings there. If it's purchased at the right time, perhaps the club purchases it, perhaps you can, you know, confer with the uh, people making the estimates to buy it at that time. So uh, that's really it. I just had a couple of comments based on my experience and I was interested in the time period when it was last painted. Uh, uh, so thank you very much uh, for, uh, answering the questions and for your presentation. Now, do we have to give you some kind of, uh, does the contractor have to give you some sort of a, some proof about the prevailing wage business? Because I wondered about that myself. That I believe that's a state requirement that's, that's distinct right. from us here. Sonia might know I, better I, than I on this. May I ask you a question? Do you have suggestion of a contractor that we should approach to get the proposal because there is a um, custom of contractors who are long-term involved in the particular uh, business like our house that other are not giving the proposal, otherwise we pay for it. So would you give us a name of somebody who would do that for free? I'm, I'm not sure if that's something I would be allowed to communicate if I had a recommendation, I don't know. Um, but if it were me, I'd go through the listing of contractors locally. And, and I know the name of the individual who provided the reference as well. He'd be one of many whom I might contact. Uh, but I do know some other contractors just living in town for all these years. But I wouldn't use me as a source for your due diligence. Um, uh, so, and, and perhaps uh, Sonia has others, but, but there are many and they are busy, but the advantage of being somebody who's seeking to contract for work is you have the flexibility in scheduling. And uh, as the quote unquote buyer, you're, you have a lot of uh, influence over whatever gets done. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia, so let me just see if Sonia has something to, to say to your hands up, Sonia, do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to assure everybody that the uh, budget and all the photos, they, they are on the website with the proposals. Okay, so thank everybody you. Everybody did get them. And I also, um, as far as uh, uh, procurement laws, 
The town has to follow those procurement laws if it's a town job and we're using CPA funds, but when we're granting, that's a different, that's a different um, creature. So it's up to the people that are asking for the grant to get their own um, proposals and contractors. We don't oh, yeah. require, we don't, the state doesn't require three quotes and there's no. Um, what we are asking for is for repairs, not just painting. It is more of a looking, he looks for areas that you need to watch out for and he repairs those areas. So it's not just painting. Right. Okay. And it's not regular maintenance. No, we know that. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask, oh, I'm Petty, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Um, yes, just, I think they could come back to us at the Historical Commission with some suggestions for other painters, other quotes. And it's definitely the case that painting is a preservation piece of the, mm -hmm. the pie, you know. <laughs> But the question is, is that once you start painting, you definitely, as Sam was alluding to, I think you can definitely find other issues that you need to address. It's a really good example of mod project creep um, for that reason. And I think it explains why there can be these big ranges in, in estimates. Thank you. I have a question um, and that is about the, the colors. Are you going, have you, do you intend to follow the same color scheme or is there work to do to find out what the original colors were or anything? the same? Yeah. We're planning to keep it the same. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't see any more hands. Last, last call for questions. All right, ladies, thank you so much for, you. for presenting and for doing it in the house, which is just gorgeous. I've been in there. It's Good. wonderful. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we are, in fact, missing any information, but maybe you're going to check the check the, the sum, the, the bid that the numbers were added up correctly and just let us know if, if there's any change. OK, not <laughs> not this moment. Though. Oh, well, I email Sonia with that information. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Good night. Sonia's, yep, she did it. Okay. Poof. All right. So now we are looking for Alan Snow to talk about the North Cemetery fence improvement. I don't see Alan Snow and the attendees, but I just brought in Ben Breger. I'm not sure. Are you handling this there's presentation? A, there's an Alan, um, Sonia. I think that's probably him. Oh, okay. Ben gets to do the West Cemetery. Hello. <laughs> there we go. There. Ready to go. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Alan. Welcome. So you are going to tell us about the improvements to the fence you would like to make at the North Cemetery. Yes. So um, the town is looking to um, replace the deteriorating fence at North Cemetery. Um, it doesn't have uh, a, a significant historic uh, paper trail that we're aware of. Um, the fence was, I'm told, replaced about 18 years ago on a project that Stan Zomek undertook with help from uh, Smith Vocational. Um, mm. And they were recreating a fence, I'm told, that was in the location previously. Um, and they built it using um, rough sawn timbers. Uh, so they're not you know, your typical two by four, the rough sawn version of that. Um, 
out of mostly pine or, or um, hemlock, it looks like. Um, so they restored or recreated, I should say, a fence that they believe were knew was there before, but we don't have proof of that. Um, <laughs> So that was my uh, thought upon using this uh, avenue to gain funding under historic preservation. And after the review with the historic commission, um, it really sounds like it's, it might not have been the appropriate approach for the funding um, to use that historic uh, preservation. But anyway, I would like to continue going forward with the process. And, and if it's not the right venue, then we'll just we apply for something else in the future. Um, but the fence is deteriorating. Um, it, uh, all the, there are eight ornamental gate posts uh, uh, sit on either side of the entry ways into the cemetery. Um, those have pretty much rotted in place. Some of them are still connected to the, the rails of the fence. Others are not. And the, the posts are just kind of sitting freely um, and if you apply any pressure to them, they tip over. Um, the majority of the support of the fence comes from granite fence posts that are sunk in the ground and support the length, most of the length of the fence. Um, if it's long. Um, and then the, uh, the one inch, uh, one inch dimensional uh, square pickets uh, that line the fence. Um, are separated by uh, one inch by five inch um, um, lumber. Uh, it's approximately 12 feet long. So they're not, um, again, not your standard off the shelf wood that you get these days at the lumber yard. So. Um. All right, are there is it time for questions, Alan, or we, did you have something? Sure. I mean, yeah. I, you read the okay. proposal. I pretty much uh, yeah. was trying to review that. So. Looks like Ben wants to say something. <laughs> cool. Add, mm -hmm. add to the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, ben Bregg, I'm a planner with the town and work closely with the Historical Commission. Um, and I just wanted to bring up another point, um, and I was going to also talk about this point uh, when I present about the West Cemetery, but um, I think it's an important to, when we're thinking about the fences at these cemeteries, it's not the fence itself that is the historic resource that we're looking to restore. It's the cemetery and the historic landscape, the historic burial ground. Um, you know, West Cemetery goes back to 1730. North Cemetery, I believe, is 1818. And so these are, you know, very significant landscapes for the town, document a lot of our history. Um, and are you know important to people today is you know still as as uh, folks go there to remember their their uh, loved ones and so I think it's just um, uh, important to remember that yes the 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 fence may have some history to it I'm not we're it's still unclear but it does a really important job of securing the West Cemetery and the North Cemetery um, in this case and. You know, I think it's both an aesthetic thing and a, you know, a, a perceived uh, um, border that, you know, this is a special place and you should respect it and you should, uh, you know, re respect the, the landscape. And also physically it does create a barrier for vehicles you know, pulling, pulling in and stuff like that. So I just wanted to add that point um, and thank you. Thanks. All right, so. Does anybody in the committee have a question? Would you? Oh, okay. Oh, Ben's hand is still up. Maybe you can pull it down. Andrew, you have a question. Thanks. Yeah. Um, a question and a comment. Um, so, th uh, first, thanks for the presentation. And then, I'm um, sorry if I like zoned out, but what what material would you were you planning on using for the replacement? Um, again, so, you know, if we're going for historic preservation, they were supposed to use the, the uh, similar materials that were there before. Um, I would prefer not to, to, I would prefer to use a material that is more rot resistant than white pine. Um, 
I mean, I have to admit there, I was amazed at how long fence did last. Um, we did paint it several times and pressure wash it. Um, so a good coat of paint definitely helps keep white pine uh, stable. But, um, you know, black locust is an option. Um, if we could source it, uh, cedar is probably the um, most common, um, you know, wood to use for fencing. Um, so. All right, very good. And then um, a broader question, and Ben, you might be able to answer this better. Do we know has there always been a fence here, right? Because my I, I'm almost wondering like you could say we we replace this fence, or you could say that we just take it down, right? I I mean it's it's not a fully enclosed cemetery to my knowledge, right? I think that there you can drive in if I remember. I don't think there's gates, so like it's it's not it's not serving a containment purpose. It's it's purely just that ornamental, and um, Again, I, I won't I won't comment on on architectural style here, but I'm wondering if we have a understanding of whether there has always been a fence or not. Again, we we don't, um, and we just have essentially a, a word of mouth uh, story that uh, there was a fence there previously, and this fence was put there to replace it um, uh, by Stan Zomek and uh, another group in town. Um, at the time, and it's you know as far as you know, there are fences on two sides, two chain link fences on the the um, south and east end of the cemetery, and then um, the north side uh, is essentially along a uh, there's a wooded area, wooded strip next to a field, a farmer's field. So that's what separates the the north side of the field, and the the entry the fence definitely helps with traffic calming uh, in the cemetery as far as you know i can imagine people would have a difficult time some people might have a difficult time um making sure they enter the cemetery on the roads uh versus <laughs> across the lawn um, so the, the fence does a really nice job of making people slow down and, and enter the cemetery um, oh, thank you, thank you. But, um, did that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, that helped. Uh, thank you very much. Anna. Uh, ben, your hand was up. Did you have something to add to that before I jump in with my Yeah, uh, thank you. I was just going to add oh. that the, uh, the, the form B, that, which is like the historical inventory form for the uh, North Cemetery, does indicate, you know, digging through the town meeting record, they, they did build a fence in 1886. So, or they allocated money to erect the fence. Um, but it's, again, the paper trail is kind of lost after that. It's unclear how long that original fence lasted, um, how it was maintained, but even what it was made out of. I, I, I worked with uh, special collections to try to find a picture or something, and we couldn't find anything. So, um, but there is at least evidence that there was a fence at one point. Um, so my question is, is kind of along the same veins. I'm looking at the information that we had in our packet today, which included some great, beautiful pictures, lovely. Um, but then also some examples of a uh, historical replica at the Dickinson homestead. And I'm curious if you happen to know what material was used there, if they used pressure treated or if they were able to get black locusts or, or if they used cedar. Um, yeah, they used Sorry. No, they I'm done. Cedar. Yeah, they use cedar. Um, and that was, you know, that was sort of um, the, the project I used mostly to, to come up with my pricing for this fence. Um, gotcha. And they, they adjusted for inflation. Um, a 10 foot section of that cedar fence um, was costing between nine and $1,200. and $1,200. Temperate section. Um, again, that was all, you know, it's all rough sawn, special cut, right? The, to be historically accurate. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. So that maybe maybe answers my question: is is that a picket fence is appropriate to an eighteen eighteen? I, I don't know if it's still in use actually, the cemetery, but but that is an appropriate style if we don't know what the original fence was but but this would be appropriate 
Uh, do you, you mean with the Dickinson? No, 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 no. A picket oh. fence at the North Cemetery. Is that appropriate yeah. to the age of the cemetery? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, historically speaking, if other cemeteries of that time period use similar. Um, I just know that they, I was told that they were trying to recreate a fence that was there previously. Um, okay, maybe from a, yeah, a diff later time perhaps. Okay, anybody else? I don't see any other hands. Yeah. Sam, oh, hands. Sam. Okay. You're muted, Sam. We don't hear you. Still don't hear you. Still don't hear you. Maybe your connection is loose. Can I ask a question while we're waiting for yes, Sam? Yes, go, go ahead. So I guess this is kind of for Ben and Alan. As we look at the fencing that we're doing across town, I mean, we have this cemetery project. Are, are they consistent? Um, are you going to try to keep them consistent while still off? It's kind of a tough one, right? Because you have like the historical level here, and then you have consistency and design here. And is there a is there a medium between the two? Or do you feel like you need to consider both? Or are you able to just go and treat each project as individual based on its own historical value. Does that question make sense? How are you balancing design consistency and historic preservation? I can, I'll speak on, on my opinion, what I'm trying to accomplish here is uh, I was looking to, to recreate a fence um, since I didn't know what historically the previous fences looked like. Right. Um, that maintains some kind of um, conformity to other historic fences in time around town. Um, and that's why I was mostly attracted to the Dickinson Homestead fence um, mm -hmm. because it is it's very prominent and everybody sees it when they come into town really. And uh, I thought it would be a good example of something we could do um, at North Cemetery. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Eddie. I think, um, early 19th century fences, you know, you could have had an, a cast iron fence, wrought iron fence, or a wooden fence in New England um, in the uh, you know, first 50 years of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is we don't know and we don't have right. very good information. Um, right, no, I just wouldn't want something terribly anachronistic, you know, that's just like- Like that, plastic. No one would ever have built that. <laughs> Okay, I think Sam has had to log off and try to come in again. Um, Tim, can you hear me? Oh, hold on, yes. But Tim, Tim has beat you to the punch. So, oh, Tim, okay. and then Sam. Uh, this is just a quick, a quick question. Uh, you mentioned the homestead fence. Uh, when I visited that site at the North Cemetery, the existing fence is very short. So you could see that there's a cemetery there. And frankly, I've never seen the cemetery because I just drive right by and you can see it. Now, if you put the homestead fence, you won't see the cemetery. So isn't that kind of counterproductive to what some of the intent is for the public? That, that was my question. I, um, again, so I was looking to, to modify the homestead fence. Um, I wouldn't create the same gate entry uh, ornamental Or of what we already have there. Um, and I think I, it would definitely be a shorter fence um, that uh, you allowed you to see over it better. You wouldn't um, have a U hedge, a U hedge behind it. <laughs> correct. There would be no evergreen hedge. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Eddie, do you have another question? No, or I should have taken. Sorry. Okay. That, that's fine. All right then I think we can move on from... I, I've, yep. I've got one question. Oh, I'm so Sarah, sorry. After... <laughs> yes, Sam, after all uh, that, yeah. Uh, so just a quick uh, segue, Alan. Are there plans or has it ever been discussed to consider a fence on the north side of the uh, North Cemetery? It, it, there's, you know, as you say, there's the 
uh, fence, on, the wire fence on the two mm -hmm. sides and the short one on the front. I'm just curious uh, from your perspective, if it's something that would be warranted in the future, distinct from what you're- Discussed uh, being a fence there. It's, um, we have approximately 20 plots left for sale in Amherst. And those are all at uh, South Cemetery. North Cemetery um, plots have all been sold. So there's no more plots for sale there. Um, and uh, the room for expansion, if there would be expansion at North Cemetery, would go in the direction, would go north. Um, so we are kind of leaving, intending to leaving that option open. Um, there's been no discussion of doing that officially, but um, it seems to be a natural um, mm. direction to head in if we were going Thank to expand you. that cemetery. Interesting. Okay. All right. Then I think we are done at this point. So thank you, Alan, for coming to talk about that. Um, thank you for your time. Yes, it. thank you. And, and I guess Ben can just, in a moment, uh, launch right into the West Cemetery proposal. Uh, great. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, so the West Cemetery is the town's oldest burial ground. Um, it's located in the center of town uh, behind uh, One East Pleasant Street, uh, and it's accessible um, off of Triangle Street and off of North Pleasant Street downtown. Um, it was, you know, constructed in 1730 uh, before Amherst was even a, a town once it when it was still a, a precinct of Hadley, um, hence West Cemetery west of Hadley. Um, the uh, the, 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 it has a lot of history of the West Cemetery. A lot of, uh, you know, Amherst's most famous people are buried there. Uh, numerous Civil War soldiers, uh, African-American Civil War soldiers as well. Um, the, uh, and the cemetery has evolved over time. Um, in the past, I would say 50 years, uh, the cemetery has not um, fared well. Uh, there is, um, you know, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, there's neglect of the cemetery. It turned into a kind of an undesirable place um, to the point where it was actually listed by the uh, Preservation Massachusetts as one of the top 10 most endangered historic resources in the state. Um, and I think subsequently that uh, jump started a planning process and a, se a series of investments into West Cemetery to get it to the condition where, it, where it's in today, which is overall uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good shape. Um, there's a 1999 West Cemetery Preservation Plan. Uh, there's been investments, uh, some of which from CPA Committee and Headstone Restoration, uh, over I think 300,000, or no, 300 headstones. Um, and actually uh, $100,000 has been allocated and that RFP is in process, procurement process right now for headstone restoration work to continue. Um, the fencing at West Cemetery currently, uh, the, the, the black uh, wrought iron metal fence um, that encompasses most of the cemetery was built with state money um, in 2001. However, uh, they did not kind of fully enclose the, the cemetery in that, um, in that round. So there's still this eastern edge of the cemetery that's a chain link fence, uh, which is currently falling apart. <laughs> and in urgent need of uh, replacement. Um, so, and I think the, it's important to note that the, the, similar to what I was saying about North Cemetery is um, the fence does a lot of important work uh, in protecting the cemetery um, and keeping it safe from uh, people, you know, coming in and out at night. Um, you know, we want West Cemetery to be a place people feel comfortable in, uh, walking and walking and um and enjoying and spending time um and i think because west cemetery is tucked back a little bit off of the street um there's this perception that it has been a perception that it's unsafe um and it's not just that there's uh you know damage to headstones there's been vandalism there's been trash and so i think part of the upkeep of west cemetery is just making it appear like it's a cared for place investing in it uh having a nice enclosed fence uh, that is uh, uniform all around and giving the appearance that it's a place that uh, should be respected. Um, 
and cared for. And so um, we are proposing, asking for money to uh, finish the work that was started in 2001. I can just quickly share my screen here if that's okay. Um, so the goal is to, the black outline is where there's currently a, the, the metal fence at West Cemetery, just to orient you, this is Triangle Street and the track is over here. And then this is one East Pleasant building and uh, Kendrick Park. So uh, we're proposing to replace the chain link fence, which you can see pictured here and mimic the uh, black picket fence um, that encompasses the rest of the cemetery. Um, and that's the first part of our ask. The second part of the ask is to um, uh, build, construct, and install signage for West Cemetery, of which there is, at this point, just one sign that we were able to uh, scrap together some funds and, and put in place just in time for the Juneteenth celebration this year. Um, we thought it was important to have a sign there. Um, and so we, at this point, you wouldn't know West Cemetery is here if you're walking on North Pleasant Street. Uh, likewise, on Triangle Street, you could see it, but you wouldn't really know what it was. Um, so we are proposing signage that recognizes and directs people towards West Cemetery um, at the two yellow locations here. And then we are also asking for money for signage um, along here. And this is just a three proposed locations. It could be at other locations, maybe at the Dickinson Museum, uh, Dickinson Cemetery plot or other, other, way, other locations. But we think um, it's important to have signage within the cemetery that conveys rules. Right now, um, the one sign we did install, which I, I regrettably don't have a picture of right now, but it mentions, you know, do not play on headstones, do not damage headstones, do not, and you'd be surprised, I've seen kids playing on headstones there, and it's, at this point, a lot of them are very unstable, it's unsafe. Um, so, you know, do not vandalize. If you see suspicious activity, call the, you know, police number, or um, certainly also uh, dogs on leash, pick up their waist, that, those kind of basic rules that you, um, we have at, you know, at all, of our, all of our conservation areas, but specifically, uh, important to preserve the history of West Cemetery and preserve the uh, the headstones in their current condition. Um, so we propose signage within the cemetery that conveys rules, and then also welcome signs that also bring people in. And I I included um, in my proposal as well um, that there's the signage would also. Um, convey interpretive material about the Amherst History Museum uh, mural, which is here. Uh, the Amherst History mural was uh, installed in, I think, 2005, but then subsequently repainted uh, onto the back of One East Pleasant Street when the carriage shops were taken down. Um, you know, I, I, one of the questions I got was, the Amherst History Mural is not historic, and I would I would agree with that. It's 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 uh, it conveys Amherst history, and it's an important part of the West Cemetery, but it itself is not historic. Um, however, that being said, I think interpretive signage um, in the cemetery could help uh, people understand and learn about the cemetery, learn about Amherst history, and also um, you know you're not going to respect what you don't you know understand and know about. So I think with people understanding the significance of the cemetery and the mural kind of playing off of each other. Um, I would hope that would lead to, you know, more respect of the cemetery and the headstones and the landscape overall. So that's the two parts of this proposal is to replace the fence, which is long overdue, um, and to install uh, signage uh, to recognize the cemetery and to convey rules and interpretive material. So. That is all. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for your time. Yes, so you can unstop sharing. Thank you. OK, great. Um, so helpful to look at pictures. All right, so looking for questions from the committee. I see Andrew's hand. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thanks for the presentation, Ben. If you had to pick, would you do the signs first or the fence first? Ooh, uh, 
I think the uh, that's a good question. The the <laughs> the the fence is um, in urgent need of repair. Um, it's 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 potentially hazardous at this point with like metal things sticking out and everything. Um, so, but I do think with the headstone restoration work that's going to happen next spring and summer, um, which is CPA funded. I would expect there to be a lot more. I would hope, you know, we want to publicize that, bring people into the cemetery, say, hey, we're investing $100,000 into the cemetery. Um, so I do think it would be important to have signs up there as well um, when, when that work is ongoing. So um, I think there's a maybe a bit more urgency for signage. And also I would say too, the wayfinding, downtown wayfinding system, we're going to have more signs downtown bringing people into West Cemetery. And so when they get there, I'd want them to have uh, more interpretive materials and um, understanding of the rules and the history of the cemetery. So I guess I would say signage. <laughs> you started Thank you. off saying the Thank you. So. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, as you know, like there's only so many dollars to go around. And Absolutely. It's important yeah. for us to know what's priority. Um, yeah. Thanks. I have a couple questions. Um, one, I would, I wouldn't have thought you could get that a whole length of metal fencing, even for fifty thousand dollars. So you're comfortable with that? You be able to buy that complete stretch of fence? Um, we, yeah, we are comfortable with that. Um, uh, it's based off of a quote that Alan got um, a few years ago using prevailing wages and. Okay. Um, I think you know we added in a little bit for contingency, but I, 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 I would yes, I do think we're confident in that number. Yes. Okay. My other question is, if if we if we thought that um, CPA money could fund signs, but not for the history mural, which is not a historic thing, are there not um, locations, grave sites within the cemetery that you might want to? have signs out like here's Emily Dickinson and her family. Right, right, um, right. That's what so many people are go going into the cemetery to find. So I guess right. I'm wondering why you would prioritize, seem to prioritize the history mural over, over the actual graves that are of historic note. Yeah, well, I think they play off of each other. I mean, Emily Dickinson's face is emblazoned on the mural and, you know, it's part of a bigger story of Amherst literary history. And so I think any sign that we had would, you know, uh, point out, you know, either if it's at the grave, it would, you know, point out the mural, show Emily's face there, or vice versa. I think a sign at the mural would call attention to Emily's grave close by. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it wasn't necessarily a matter of prioritizing the mural. It's more just um, right now there's, there's, uh, nothing that explains what people are looking at when they're looking at the mural. And I think that's all, also important for understanding the significance of West Cemetery um, because most of those people uh, depicted on there are buried <laughs> right in the cemetery right there as well. Um, and so I, I could imagine having like a, a map of the cemetery Key so to the at, key. Yeah, as you're interpreting the mural, show, oh, this person's buried here, go visit their grave, right. something like that. So, um, yeah, I think it's almost like even though the mural and the cemetery came at very different times in history, they are so um, interconnected in that way. Okay, thank you. Let me just see. Okay, Sam? Uh, yeah, I just had a comment, uh, Ben. Thanks for the presentation. I, in walking around the cemetery, which I had not done for decades, I, I was really struck. I mean, it's really an impressive place. Uh, I noticed just a dramatic uh, change in terms of the the impact from my perspective that the current metal fencing made. Because I remember when I was, you know, a kid in high school, whatever, people, guys would be going through there. You'd see cans, uh, weekend nights, whatever. Uh, 
going through there now, it really has a particular feeling. And if you take that walk and you start looking at the gravestones, which I was doing, uh, you kind of feel it. It's really quite nice. And I, I think that the um, metal fencing style the that currently exists on three quarters and you're hoping to continue uh, adds to that. I, I really, I really felt it. I did. You also see the uh, family sponsored fence around the Dickinson uh, uh, location and various markers on her grave. I'd almost like to see an additional perimeter around that <laughs> to, to keep it safe. But I, I just wanted to give kudos to whoever's been uh, doing the work uh, in there from the last time I went there. It's quite noticeable. Yeah, yeah, that would, thank you. That would 100% be Alan and his uh, crew in the, in the grounds and maintenance division. They do a great job with West Cemetery. All right, any other questions about the West? I, I did want to point out that Amherst is west of, excuse me, is east of Hadley. So it can't be western part of Hadley. <laughs> it yeah, may be the western point. part, western part of Amherst, western part right. of the third precinct, but it's right. not west. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll look, I'll look <laughs> <at that. laughs> so, anyway, it just doesn't affect the application. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I don't see, I don't see any other questions. So That'll do. Thank you for your time. Thank you for Thank coming you. tonight. And uh, oh, it's gone already. All right. So for our final presentation this evening should be Meg Gage, I think, for the District One Neighborhood Association and the Phase One Research for a Mill River historic trail, interpretive trail. Could you, thanks so much, Sarah, and I'll get my camera going. Could you also invite two other presenters, uh, Eric Johnson and Dave Mix, Dave Mix Barrington? Um, Sonia, do you see them? Yeah, I'm doing Yeah, it. okay. Thank you for, for waiting. We're a little bit behind, I know. That's okay. See one and a half of you. <laughs> I'm joined here by Bill Robinson, who's going to also make a okay. be participating. There's Eric. Hi, Eric. Okay. He was in there before. The yeah. Other day. So we can hear everything we say. And David is materializing, yep. I think. Or... Okay. Well, welcome. Um, Thank you. Please go ahead. Tell us. And we do have new members on the committee this year, so. Great. You can, yeah. So um, we'd like to make fairly brief remarks. So with this chance for questions and to hear where your, uh, what your thoughts are about this. We're very happy to be back with you all at the CPA committee with a revised and dramatically smaller funding request this time for the preliminary research of the Mill River History Trail. Unlike last year, for those of you who weren't on the committee last year, when we brought a proposal to support the entire project, this year we're seeking funding only for the first step of archival and field research. This first step will lay the necessary groundwork to work with the Conservation Commission and others to develop a comprehensive plan for implementing the history trail that we envision and that we'd be delighted to talk with you about. But this particular proposal is just the research. This research, this larger project down the road will include signage, development of a web page, securing the artifacts safely in the strong house, building a neighborhood oversight committee, and engaging a larger community to build public stewardship and enjoyment of the uh, uh, historic and natural treasure along the Mill River Conservation Area. And I shouldn't probably even say this because now I don't want to distract you. That's not what we're seeking funding for this year just the research, but it's research in order to achieve this uh, vision of an important community resource. Mm -hmm. The site and historic documents are threatened if they're not protected. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the materials we sent, you saw the uh, artifacts that have been gathered and Bill here, thanks to Bill, we know who has them. Hopefully they can be secured. Kay uh, Kaner did a huge amount of research before she 
uh, passed away and we understand, and it was confirmed by Pete, it's in boxes in Pete Westover's basement, not getting any younger. Uh, I had a hour conversation with a 99 year old Pete Kozlaskis who lives in Summer Street, who worked in the um, wood, uh, lumber yard, Amherst Woodworking Company, Amherst Woodworking Company uh, fueled, uh, powered by the Puffers Pond waterfall, which is where uh, Mill Hollow Apartments is. He, he actually worked there as a high school student. Not only will our project identify and protect valuable historic artifacts and features, we will bring to life this little known entrepreneurial chapter in Amherst history. North Amherst was an industrial center in Western Massachusetts from the second half of the 18th century. There were six mills in 1775 on the Mill River already. To the early 20th century when manufacturing moved to Holyoke and Springfield drawn by the great power of the Connecticut, greater power of the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. We're one of the wonderful things about living in Amherst is we have access to the University of Massachusetts deep branch of academic and research talent. We're so fortunate to be working with Dr. Eric Johnson, community archeologist who knows our community well. He has worked at the Dickinson Homestead, for example, and lived here a long time. So I'm gonna pass this over to Eric. Dr. Johnson, Eric. <laughs> well, you were talking about Faye Caner. Faye Caner, not Kay Fainer. No, Kay. I was wondering Sorry. what you were saying. Is, Faye, Caner. Faye Caner. She's the one whose stuff is in the basement of Pete Westover. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's like, she, thank you. Yeah. Correction, correction noted. Thank you. All right. She lived up on Market Hulu. Yep. All right. Yeah. So I see Eric. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what Meg, Meg said, that the objective of the research project is to acquire information on the mills and the other sites that we're looking at on the past history and on their present condition. And that information will be important for the second phase of the project, the interpretive historic trail that will lead into that. And the other thing that the research is going to do David. is to encourage stewardship because the members of the community will know more about the history of the sites, they'll become aware of their condition, including possible threats to their integrity. And knowing that will encourage people to take care of the sites and protect them. And this is a community archeology span project, it comes from the community, not from the academy. The archeologist is are working for the community not for a developer. <laughs> so our field research will be known about, our results will be shared, and our research has, as Meg uh, pointed out, two components, archival research and field research. And the archival research includes studying documents like maps, deeds, census records, tax records, written histories, it includes talking to people, people like Bill Robinson, who know so much about these places and their history. And the field research does not, the field research does not involve any digging. Any it is article. documenting the present condition of the sites by mapping them and photographing them. And in addition to reporting the results of the research, uh, we will complete historic site inventory forms for each site and send them to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, share them with the town and the community. I really hope and I really believe that the interest we generate in our work and in its results will increase public awareness of historic archeological sites, these ones in particular, and, and really historic sites in general. They, they are fragile and they are tangible links to the past. Um, with um, being at an archeological site where you have some information about it, it really invites visitors to contemplate our past in a, a really positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so David, do David is um, a community uh, on our committee, our community, our neighborhood committee, David McSparrington. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is David McSparrington. I live on Pine Street. I've lived there since 1995. And during that time since then to now, I've spent most days of the week 
bringing a dog over one of the areas of Mill River every uh, um, on, on morning walks. I'm very familiar with the area there. Uh, I love the Mill River. It's a beautiful place. I really like the fact that there's now stories there that have been put up on the storyboards. And I think it's great for the plate people to live the, live the, to know that area and learn about it and um, get closer to it. I first learned about the Mill River in 1980 when I was an undergraduate at Amherst College and I took geology. And everybody who takes geology at Amherst and a whole lot of people who take geology at UMass go down to Mill River because it's nearby to see how the shape of water flowing through um, rivers, what, how their shape is expressed by the, where the water is flowing and, and, and this sort of thing. It's a geology thing to learn. And one of the things I learned when I was there is that the landscape, the waterscape of the Mill, Mill River is artificial. It's, I mean, I've known it for a long time, but I didn't know it then that uh, why is there a river here? Why is there a river there? Why is there a valley? This is all explained by the fact that this was made, uh, the mill races for the, for the uh, mill races were established where the, where the water was sent and so forth. And that's carved the landscape out and made the, lands the landscape has been that way. Uh, Puffer's Pond was artificially built by Mr. Puffer, I believe. And uh, it's, the, <laughs> maybe not, it was named after him later. Bill knows this more far than I do. Uh, so the land is made by the history in this, in this, in this case, and it's great to have a connection to it. Uh, a couple of years ago, I took a walk through this area that Donna organized with Bill and Eric, and I learned all kinds of things about uh, what used to be there, how it got there, what was done there. And I'd like to have that understanding available for anybody to look at on signs as appropriate. And uh, my role in this would be as a community member to uh, try to help discuss where the, eventually where should the signs be? What should they look like? Where do they go? That would in collaboration with the Conservation Commission and so forth about where that would go. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Is, is that it for the, the presentation? Yeah. Bill, the right are, Bill is here to answer questions. He okay. wrote okay. this book about North Amherst with Pat Holland and he's the, uh, most knowledgeable person I've ever met about. Okay. <laughs> All right. But it's time time for us to ask questions or do you have more to tell? All right. Nope. So then I will open it up. Anybody? I will start off with one. Um, is the, is the, the archival research, um, is that primarily to, uh, so, so in the, if, future phase, you know what the story is to put on the interpretive signs, or is it helping focus where this field archaeology will happen? That is, is are you, do you think there are sites of interest and you don't know exactly where they are, or you know where everything is? So that's the, that's my overall the sites there, yeah. Yeah, so I think Eric. Um, it's not so much trying to identify where other sites are. It's like you said, telling the story of okay. the sites. Okay. And there so, are some sites that are hard to get to, which we probably wouldn't want to. It would be too dangerous for people to too, walk around there. Too dangerous. Mm. And, and the Conservation Commission doesn't want a lot of people wandering off the trail into the conservation area. Right. But like the bunghole, for yeah, example. Yeah, that would be a dangerous one to try to walk around and look at. Also, the uh, Cushman paper mills in that area is pretty dangerous to walk around. In. Yeah. But like the Roberts mills, it's very easy to yeah. walk by them and nobody's mm -hmm. going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. so, so can the field research, I mean, these things would happen at the same time or does one have to happen before the other? I always like to have as much as the art of the archival done first. Um, it may give us hints of as to what we're looking at when we see something um, and the significance of um, you know, parts of the structures that are still preserved. And maybe also the extent of them. I mean, I know there, there are some traces of, of buildings or structures, but yeah. would this information yeah. help you know how, you know, what the plan of it was and maybe where to look for more? Remnants? Uh, quite possibly. 
and um, and also if we find that you know what we see now is a small part of a footprint of a much larger structure that can be conveyed to the the visitor mm -hmm. who um, you know can imagine it the way it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I have another question. Sam, Sam, so, sorry, Sam has one. Who? Sam has a Sam. question. He's, he's muted, okay. but he has a question. Okay. Ah, there we go. It, okay. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Meg, uh, Eric, David, and I forget Bill. the other gentleman, Bill. Bill. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting project to listen to in so many ways. Um, I, I think it's great that you're seeking to do something that will provide education on the history of the town, having gone to Puffer's Pond as a kid and jumping off all the cliffs back then Ooh. when we, <laughs> we, were, we were able to, which we're not able to do now. Uh, yeah, all the right people from my time period are very Oops. familiar with that region, yeah. having grown up in town. All but the I survivors. never really. Uh, yeah, all, everyone made it through, but uh, that was a different era. But what I bring that up in context of, I never really knew about all the history related to the area. I know the part for name, of course, but not really all the different things that you're talking about. And I find that just very interesting. Um, that's just my comment and the fact that it's community driven. My question is, uh, I recall you coming uh, before us the prior year. I'm wondering if you can share with us any information you might have received from the Conservation Commission and or the Historical Commission that may have uh, uh, influenced your approach to your proposal this year. Um, uh, the Historic Commission was very interested in trying to help us fit the guidelines of the CPA and particularly Robin Fordham did a lot of research uh, we also worked, and she's also helping us apply for other funding that would come in later. Um, and there was their suggestion to uh, do exactly what we did. <laughs> uh, the Conservation Commission didn't advise us on our proposal so much as to uh, share with us their interest in, um, I hate to use the word branding when we're talking about conservation land, but in uh, creating signs that indicate Amherst trail system, uh, which they feel isn't adequately appreciated because there's, we have so many wonderful trails. So we would work with them to uh, make sure that our signs aligned with their wishes to uh, create a unified image. I, the word branding just sounds so awful, but that may have been the word they used, but you know what I, I mean, to have a, a, consistent, a logo. A consistent. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, can I jump in? Sorry. <laughs> Please. Thanks. So, I'm sorry, Anna. No, it's fine. It's fine. Hi, Meg. Um, Hi, so Anna. it's 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 less branding. It's just to give a little context. We are getting inundated with requests for signage, and um, we're trying to be very comprehensive and thoughtful in, in how we put signage in our wild preserved spaces. Um, and so we also didn't have enough time to deliberate on that. We're not necessarily deliberating on it, but um, our, our input is less about the, the content of the specific proposal, which is much more about historic preservation. We're more concerned with the use of the conservation land and, you know, Megan and her team have been very, um, responsive and respectful of our, uh, our wishes in that. So, um, we have not necessarily had a chance to really continue talking about it, but we, Meg came to our meeting last week. And when we get to deliberating out of this questions phase, I will happily speak more about what CONCOM discussed. I'd just like to say that Puffer's Pond was originally owned by the, the Wheelocks and the Marshall family, and it was split 50-50 right up the me uh, middle of it. And that Steve Puffer would pay them for the use of the pond by giving them heights. So it, it it's now was never really Puffer's Pond, but it got Steve, that name. Steve Puffer's Steve father. Puffer. His father. Yeah, he might have started it. Yeah, yeah anyway, Steve Puffer, yeah. Eric, can I just make a note? I don't know if this is uh, allowed or not, but Robin is also in the audience and does have oh, her good. hand. Uh, well, I would. I know, I was, sorry. Yeah, I well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I first want to hear from Tim, because he's, yeah. Oh. 
Uh, yes, um, yeah, I'm going to ask the same question I've asked of another applicant, and that is, uh, considering the funding, had you considered uh, talking with UMass or Amherst College to see if this might be a, a thesis for either graduates or undergraduates at Amherst? Um, seems to me that this might be a very good project for uh, students to conduct this archival study. Um, we yeah, there have been students like from yeah. UMass that have Miller or something that did a study of the Mill River. Yeah, there, it might be down the road, uh, but we need to focus on getting our project launched. Uh, and uh, for example, we're thrilled that Eric, uh, you know, Dr. Johnson himself uh, is doing the research, not a graduate student. We're, we love graduate students. I'll tell you the students <laughs> that I would most like to get involved are high school students. And that's actually my first when I was teaching at Amherst High School a gazillion years ago, um, I had students write research papers and I would get these great papers like the hat factory uh, and the uh, pencil mill and so on. And these kids had done, high school students had done research in our local library and at the Strong House and uh, were writing these papers. And so, I mean, I think we could get college students to write theses on this. Uh, maybe as step two. Well, the per the, frankly, the, the purpose of the question is you probably know we have quite a bit of uh, requests and not very many dollars to distribute. And I'm just thinking uh, whether that you've, whether you've even considered that as an alternative funding source. The, and I guess like- Graduate students? Could, yeah. Well, uh, if or we don't get so this- tweak, You yeah. could quote, save some money. Uh, or the town might save, quote, save some money. That sure. was the That'd purpose of the question, yeah. and I think you answered the question, so thank you. Right. It's a, a follow-up. Oh, sorry. I just have a follow-up on that question. You know, Tim, I think it's it's always a valid suggestion, and I think the realities of, of seeking graduate or undergraduate student support are never quite that easy. I think that yeah. it's it's really not, it's not a matter of just going to a faculty member and saying, hey, we have this research project, right? And so I just, I, I always want to, this little flag comes up for me in my head of, of you know, it's it's not a simple ask to do that when when the curriculum is so defined and and often it's the students who come up with the proposals themselves. So I just, I, I you know, while it's a great idea in theory, I think often the reality of that is not um, not always realistic. Yeah, and if the purpose of that would be to find alternative funding, there are lots of other alternative funding ideas we have. Okay, we well, need to I mean, establish the kind of basic parameter, establish that there's a project here first. That's our, that's our. Okay, well, here. maybe I will reserve until we have a discussion amongst the okay. committee. Thank you. Um, Are there any just, more? I would like to just add yes. a note about the last question. Um, I expect to be working with a professional researcher who does archival research. She is fantastic. She was a colleague. Of, she was a colleague of mine at UMass. Um, and grad students uh, want to get paid as much as anybody else does. Um, so uh, they will. They would require money. I, I always try to see if I can get, particularly undergraduates involved in any project that I do, you know, depending on the schedule and depending on people's interests and availability. I have one question. Um, I'm sorry, David has his hand up or I, maybe that's left over. No, I, I just wanted to, oops, there we go. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to second that point. Um, when you, I mean, just in advising students and having student projects, when you do a student project, your priority has to be the good of the student. If you want the job actually done, you much often want to get it done by, by professionals. And then this spins off into good projects, which can make things that it let, that lets it happen. But when you're actually looking for a deliverable, you don't want to center yourself on, you don't want to assume that you're going to go to students for their own stuff and get, anyway. Right. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other committee hands up. Um, so that means I think we could just go directly to public 
comment and okay. invite Robin to speak if she, Meg, you wanted to? I just want to uh, hope that everybody saw the letter B Barbara Puffer yes. sent. Good. Mm -hmm. And the, the, there are families around here who, the Puffers and the Joneses and the, that are still, that are very uh, interested in tracking this project. Is, have you considered oral history as part of the? Mm -hmm. yeah. I just did an okay. hour of taping of this uh, 99 year old Peter Kozlaskis who his mother immigrated here from uh, Lithuania. Wow, cool. All right, I see hands going back up. Okay, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, uh, Meg, for and, and all for communicating. Uh, and I see Robin's hand up, so I'm hoping she might also enlighten us on some of the changes that you might have made from last year based on feedback. And my assumption is some of the references to artifacts and whatnot uh, in the presentation, it was nice to see the photographs and all. Uh, but if there's anything else you could add, and, uh, and I'd lost, like to also hear from Robin, thank you. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna bring in Robin yet, okay? I understand, because, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Anna. I have a, a, a critical and, and very important question, um, which is Meg, when will we be able to get uh, Amherst Clam, or no, Cushman Clam Club uh, apparel from this? It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> critical. <laughs> that's, a great fun, that's a great fundraising idea. All right, uh, that was, sorry, Sarah, I have to ask. It's okay, that's okay. It's, I, I mean, I can, I can see it now. It's, I, right? It's like, you're talking about the Clam Bait Club. Yeah. It's called the Clam Bait <laughs> Yes, I can see. I mean, I can see the apparel. I, I, we should oh, talk because okay. I've got I've got ideas. Anyway, right. <laughs> we, I'll, we can move on now, Sarah. I, I, I think okay. the, uh, the patrons that went to the clam bake they could envision most anything. <laughs> so after, after a few drinks, it was a pretty wild place. <laughs> well, and and the Drake coming back too. I mean, yeah. my goodness, what? All right, so Drake, any none more? of us were allowed to go to when we were teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> or even in college, but anyway. <laughs> All right. So I think that ends this formal part, but if everyone, Meg, if your group will just linger, we'll bring in Robin as a member of the public and see if she has a comment. I don't know if there are any other members of the public wishing to speak, but- I'm turn it off. No, we don't need to answer that. No, I'm just turning off the ring. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, let's see if you can see me in my car. Yes, oh, oh my gosh, you're driving. <laughs> no, I pulled over. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you guys have been keeping me company on my trips from Vermont to Amherst. Hello, everyone. We're better than NPR. Hello. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to see everyone. I was gonna say most of you know me as the former uh, historical commissioner up to the CPA. Um, uh, Hetty has bravely taken on that role. Um, I'm so happy to have her there. Um, you might remember me as the person who was obsessed with the definitions behind the CPA law and guidance about what can be funded. So we'll have a little bit of a, uh, a return <laughs> to that theme. I just want to go quickly. Uh, I have some public comments on, uh, on most of the projects that I'm going to be as absolutely as brief as I can, which I think is relatively brief. Um, uh, in ter terms of the two uh, historic houses, um, and very much in support of those projects as a member of the Historic Commission and as a member of the public, um, I just wanted to remind uh, the CPA committee uh, from the historic preservation standpoint that a public view is always um, uh, considered uh, a public resource. So CPA funds can actually be used to, um, for example, I used to own a house on Halleck Street which uh, had a, um, a beautiful window in the attic. Had I known of CPA funds then, I might've applied for them. It's not necessary um, for the property, property to be accessible to the public. It's great that it is, but um, keep that in mind as you go forward. Public view is a public resource. Um, as far as the fences are concerned, I wanted to thank Ben Greger because I, in our historical commission meeting, brought up the question of, well, the fences are historic, ergo, we can't 
um, fund them. And actually in conversations that I had with Hetty afterwards, um, we realized, I realized we realized um, exactly what Ben said, which is that the important formula behind uh, historic preservation in terms of CPA is that you have a resource and um, you apply a verb to it. And in this case with the fences, and, uh, he's absolutely correct that the cemeteries themselves are the resource and the fences are effective um, measures for preservation. Um, as far as the North Cemetery was concerned, my one comment was just that um, it would be great if the uh, committees felt like it was appropriate for the Historical Commission to weigh in on the design review. Um, that seems like the most logical place <coughs> for comment on a appropriate historical fence to go. Um, as far as the signage proportion of um, that particular ask, this is where I was going to get back into issues around what CPA can and can't fund. And last year, after pouring over all the documentation, I determined that there's nothing in the CPA language that says you can fund it, and there's nothing that says that you can't. Um, but there is some language around um, uh, CPA funds not being able to be used for two, for example, write a history of something. And I see uh, signage as an interpretive function and not a preservation function. Um, I'm very in support of the signage. Um, I just have a question about um, whether or not it should be funded with CPA funds. And again, going back to this larger idea, CPA funds are special. And um, that is why we sit on this committee in order to determine um, the best way for them to be distributed. So I'd encourage you, if you feel so inclined to take up that question. Uh, and then finally, the Mill River Project, which um, I'm so uh, thankful for Meg being patient with me <laughs> over this last year, while we hammered out uh, a new way to uh, break this project up into two phases so that it would fit under the guidelines of the CPA. Um, I think Sonia and the town are determining where best uh, to apply funds. I won't go into uh, the... Um, the answer that it seems like the administrative line item um, is what we would use for uh, surveys. Um, but Sarah, I believe, has my information on that. I know Anthony had it. We'll talk about that separately. Um, but I'm, uh, I have been delighted to work with Meg uh, over the last year, um, very much in support of this project. Um, uh, it does align with the guidelines. It's an absolutely necessary first step. Um, and I did want to make the point that I think Meg brought up, which is that um, we are trying to seek some additional funding through the National Trust Preservation Funds. It's a, it's a um, small grant program. It uh, has three rounds a year. Um, I'm, I was working with Ben to have the town apply basically for half of the ask that, um, that uh, Meg's group has asked for. So it would be a, a conditional funding that if those funds came through, then the CPA funds um, would be reduced, which would be great. It would mean more, um, as just as much money for the project and more uh, CPA money for the town. And as a member of the Historic Commission, I'm trying to um, help these historic preservation projects do exactly that, access uh, other resources that might be appropriate so that our CPA funds can go further. And with that, um, I will just say thank you. It did. Anybody? Had, I don't know if anybody had a question for me. I'm just a member of the public. I don't know if I can answer questions, but happy to if that fits with the agenda. Has the C, the Historic Commission, Hetty, uh, and perhaps Robin, uh, rendered a, an opinion at all as of yet related to the project? I think this is a wonderful project. Um, I I think it has so many components that that fit with our mission, um, such as I understand it in the early stages at the moment. And apologies for early on kind of wading into something that I probably shouldn't have gotten well, into. <laughs> and I think Sam's, Sam's inviting us to go there again. Um, um, I think that Robin and Hetty may well 
have their own conversations and you know Hetty will bring back the opinions of the, the historical commission to the group. Um, Matt, yes, Meg. I can send you the email that Jane Wald sent me in response to my question after many conversations that I, I think it seems like you support this and she wrote a very enthusiastic yes. Then please send it to Sonia. Okay, okay, send everything, well, anything to Sonia and she will- check with Jane, since she sent it to me, I'll just be sure that's oh, cool. Sure, sure. But, yeah. but Sonia will distribute it to the, to the group. Okay, um, are there, thank you, Robin. Thanks for your, your thank comments. You. It's good thank to you, see Robin. You. Um, Pleasure Robin. to see everybody. Yes, okay, drive safely. Thanks, Robin. Is there anyone else out there in attendees who might want to speak? Robin's our only attendee just say, at this point. Just okay. Saying. All right, Sonia, there's no one else. So Bill wanted Sorry, to- Sorry, I was talking, but I forgot. I didn't have my mic on. No, there's no one else. <laughs> okay, I'll get Bill, see you over here. Uh, yeah. Meg, yeah? Bill wanted to say something. I don't I've know. I've been walking through the Mill River area for many, many years. I think it would be an excellent idea to put signs up to mark where the mills were, because I've seen so many people looking down or wondering what was going on. So if they could have signs there identifying what would go on there, I think would be an excellent idea. I can't see anything uh, negative about it at all. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's just this pesky thing called the legislation. That's, the, <laughs> that's I'm not a salesman or anything. Yeah, but no. <laughs> it, it'd be an excellent idea. I'm yeah. just a high school graduate. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just giving you my point of view. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> we hear you. Okay. Well, I think then um, we just say thank you for attending tonight, all four of you, and uh, sharing this project with us. Thank you for all the hard work you do. Okay. A pleasure. So good night. If the committee will stay on. <clears throat> all right. I think it's just us now. Um, Super, so we're only a little bit over time. Um, I just wanna reiterate somebody who somebody, maybe it was Katie who came in, came in late, glad you could make it. Sarah Isinger um, was not able to come at all, but that next week we meet on Wednesday, okay? The following week, week we meet on Thursday again and have our public hearing and may begin our deliberations. All right, so that's all I have to say. Does anyone else have? some information we need. Okay, then Sonia, unless you know of something else we need to do. No. Nope. nope, okay. Then Sorry. this meeting will be adjourned at 8.18 and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.